today we are so blessed to have Dr. Bill Winston with us. I've not, uh, praise God. I've ministered with him a couple of times before in Tindley Park, um, Illinois, and I've known him from a distance, but the last couple of years at the Copeland's conference, we've got to visit and I just asked him if he would come and bless us. And I tell you what a blessing this man has been. I've been listening to a lot of your teaching and I sure am praying that you'll teach on certain things, but I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> but I tell you what, he lit a fire on the inside of me. This man's full of the word of God and he's got an awesome revelation. And so, uh, Bill Winston, we're glad to welcome you, brother. Come up here. And... So is there anything you want to put this table uh, different? Or no, what do you want I, I to think do? that's fine. I think that's fine. Is that okay? Yeah, that's you good. Okay. Amen. Amen. Woo, 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 woo. Stand to your feet. No, don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. Amen. We're going to pray first and then stand and then sit. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to your people. Thank you for the anointing that's in this house, on this meeting, and on this leadership that's here. Thank you for the anointing on me and these lips of clay, that I do speak this word with excellence, accuracy, and boldness, asking you to think through my mind, speak through my lips, and this word will come forth unhindered, unchecked by any outside force. And we fully expect signs, wonders, and miracles to confirm the word. We thank you for it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. If you believe it, shout amen. amen. Take a seat, please. Well, it is a blessing to uh, be at a meeting of this anointed man of God that's here. Give him a hand clap, please, and he's, I'm telling you. My wife and I, I she found out where I was going, and uh, she used to travel with me, but I, I wore out, <laughs> you know. Uh, she doesn't do that much anymore, but... She said, she found out I was coming to preach for the great Andrew Womack. And she, amen, she said, wow, remember when we used to sit at the TV and listen at him? Praise God. We we're trying to get started there in Chicago and so forth. And he had such a revelatory word, a word that would not only inform you, but encourage you. And that's the goodness about him. That old Texas drawl or whatever that is that he's got. <laughs> Tell you. And um, so it's just a privilege to be here. Again, give him one more hand and clap. I think he deserves, he and the First Lady deserve a, a round of applause. Wow. Well, he, now he's challenged me. He said, I hope he preaches all well. And let me, let me just say this. I'm going to, I, I want to talk today, and I'm speaking also tonight. And um, we're going to be talking about a couple of topics that I think are relevant for today. You're seeing, oh, you're seeing a lot of things happen today. You're seeing some transition taking place politically and so forth. And basically, um, my thought was to teach somewhat on something called, vi in the daytime, visionary leadership. Visionary leadership. Now, it's going to take a little turn that perhaps you... Um, might not have expected, but it's, it's a good thing. Um, this um, teaching uh, on leadership is something uh, that is needed <clears throat> by all people in the kingdom because at one time in your life, you're going to lead. You're going to be called to lead. If you have a gift, which you do have, then that gift is going to be rising to the top. And if that be the case, then you're going to lead in that area, hopefully, of that gift. And um, the visionary leadership part is the part that we've got to see something. To go somewhere, you've got to see somewhere. And uh, it's key that we see some things. But let me just read a foundation scripture. Let's go over to Proverbs, if you have your Bible, please. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 29. <clears throat> now, I'm going to start out one place, but I guarantee you I'm going to end up another. Uh, this is Proverbs chapter 29. And I'm going to look here at verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 
All right, I see you have the scriptures up there. Do they have the Amplified Translation on that, uh, Andrew? Okay. Uh, if you have the Amplified Translation, you can put that up there as well. Praise God. I'm trying to see it from over here. The, where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, fortunate, and enviable is he. Glory to God. So it's interesting, he that has no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. When there's no redemptive revelation of God. You know, one of the things that Jesus came to do, he came to wipe out any trace that you ever had what you had and to bring you into a place where there's nothing about your life that could mock your redemptive testimony. He claimed if, 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 if you got saved and, and came in with whatever you came in with, um, Jesus has provided a way for you to get so free of that till there's no trace of it ever being in your life. I mean, that's good. I said, that's good. And, um, and so we uh, have to realize that many times this, um, the, the plan of God goes much further than the ideas of a man. Um, to really get into God's plan, you need to get revelation of something. And that is a little bit further than this natural knowledge. So where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no redemptive revelation of God. Now, first, I would like to start off talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Let's go over to Matthew's gospel, chapter 6, please. Matthew, chapter 6. <clears throat> I just got off the airplane 15 minutes ago. But when you have private transportation, you can do that. <laughs> Amen. Don't, hey, no haters now. No haters. Don't hate. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Love you too. Amen. <laughs> uh, he says here in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 6. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knows what you, things you have need of, even before you ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm sure you've heard that. And then down at verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For he that he'll hate one and love the other, else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Thank you. <laughs> the Holy Spirit said, look in front of you. There are the words right there. Okay. All right. Praise God. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is a helper? He'll keep you from looking stupid. All right. Look at verse 25. Therefore say unto them, to, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall put on <clears throat> or, or nor what you shall, your body for what you shall put on for is not the, let me read it down here, praise God. Uh, uh, say what you shall eat, what you shall drink is not the life more than meat or the body than raiment. Then he says next verse, praise God. Behold the fowls of the air, so they reap, neither they sow, gather into barns. Keep going on down, please. <clears throat> Which of you, by taking thought, could add one cubit to your statue? Keep going. And why take ye thought for raiments? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Say, toil not. <laughs> and yet I say unto you, the even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Say faith. faith. Say, I have faith. I have faith. Therefore, I t take no thought saying, what shall you eat, what shall you drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. But your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these say it, things shall be what? Added to you. Now this is interesting because he said all these things shall be added to you. Do you realize that you were never designed to add to yourself? You were designed that God add to you. Oh yeah, okay. This is the right group. I see it right now. Let's talk about the kingdom of God for just a moment because I've always, I've discovered, this is me now, unless a person has an understanding of the kingdom, they really can't understand the Bible the way God planned for it. Oh, you can get bits and pieces and so forth out of it. But this whole thing is about the kingdom. Matter of fact, this Bible is your constitution. And so as you look at this, <clears throat> this Bible and looking at it in terms of its constitution and a government, he said in Isaiah, the government shall be upon his shoulder. What shoulder? He's talking about Christ, talking about the body of Christ. And he's saying here that there in this kingdom, we don't vote. In this kingdom, it's sovereign where we have a king. I went to one of the nations in Africa, one of the nations that still has a monarchy and has a king. And it's kind of interesting about that. They wanted me to come and see the king or see in the royal, um, where they receive people and so forth and so on. I remember going in and there was a witch doctor right outside the doors shaking beads at me as I was going in. How many of you know witchcraft can't touch you? All yeah. right, yeah, good, good, amen. But I was going in to see the king, sovereign. And I'm saying, when you're talking about the kingdom, you're talking about a government and it's sovereign. The number 12 is the number of government. He picked 12 disciples. And so it's sovereign. And it's something that um, when the king gives a word, the Bible says in Matthew 13, the word of the kingdom. And when that word is given, it is supreme, it is above everything. And it comes with the power of the king. The uh, idea about this king and his kingdom is that it also has reference to a domain or territory. And when you're talking about um, wherever you go, he told Joshua in Joshua 1.3, every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon that have I given you. And this whole idea about domain is that what the king is ruling over. And one of the things that I had to learn is I had to learn this kingdom because I, you know, came from a place where, you know, I did it my way. Well, there's only one way to do it when you come into the kingdom. And that's the way that the king has planned for you to do it. Now, as we look at this, this covenant or this constitution of which I call it, um, of the king, this expresses the word uh, and the laws of the kingdom. And if you're going to run a kingdom, you've got to have order. And that order is usually set up by laws. And, you know, you see today, you see a lot of rebellion going on. And people hadn't been taught to submit uh, to the laws of the land and so forth. We're having some things going on in Chicago, but we might talk about more of that tonight. But, but I'm determined to overcome those things in Jesus' name, you know. <laughs> this is a mess going on here. All right, now, so you and I are born again. And when we're born again, the Bible says in John 3.3, 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. Another translation, Amplified, says, you must be born from above. 
So you and I are born from above. Now the first birth was not that. The first birth was a different birth. But now you and I, once we come and receive the king, we're born again and now we become citizens of a whole nother kingdom. Somebody said, well, I know all of this. Well, I'm just getting you prepared for where I'm going. And so now as we see this, once you become a citizen of the kingdom, you have the rights of the kingdom. You have the rights of this government. It's something that uh, is a privilege in the kingdom um, to uh, access the provisions of the king. That everything that you'll ever need is in that kingdom. Just like everything Adam would ever need is in the garden. Watch this. And if it's not in the garden, he didn't need it. So it's the same thing about this kingdom. Now, in living in the kingdom, it's a new order of living by faith. That's very important. Living in the kingdom is a new order of living by faith. Now, Jesus preached this several places. And he came to establish this kingdom. The disciples wanted to, when he's gonna set up a natural kingdom, but the first kingdom had to be established is a kingdom in our hearts that we had to have what in us to eventually come out of us. And so when I came to uh, Chicago, I came to Chicago with $200. And I tell this almost everywhere I go, but I came under the orders of the king. Now I came from the military. Military, I was flying fighters in the military. And what you receive is orders. And it says, please report to um, McDill Air Force Base, you know, in Florida, and uh, so forth and so on, and be there on certain date. And once I went to McDill, and I'm there, they're ready to receive me and have housing for me and my family. They have uh, a commissary, they have dental for my a family, they have schools for my kids, everything because I'm serving the king. Okay? Now, as I came to Chicago, I came with $200, but a sister said, God spoke to me and told me to open my home to you and your family. Not only that, she said, I would stay in another room. He said to give you the master bedroom. I said, that must be God. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that's what happened. And I'm under orders of the king. Now, somebody calls me to preach at their little place. My wife and I, were instruct, under instructions of the king, went and started Saturday meetings at a local hotel that rented us a ballroom. And we started these Saturday meetings. So now, as we had these meetings, some people came and saw us. And then one person who came said, could you come and preach for this group that I have uh, on next Sunday afternoon or evening or whatever it was? Well, I didn't have that much to do. I said, well, let me check my schedule. Let me see, <laughs> praise God. But I went and preached. When I preached, miracles broke out. And that person said to me, the Lord is telling me, let me put it in my own words, the king is telling me to turn this ministry over to you. I said, well, hold it. Let me check with the king. Let me just see if the king telling me that. So what did they do? They actually turned it over to me. It was only about 25, 30 people or so. And I started. It just so happened that the place that she turned over to me, this lady, it was in the roughest area of Chicago, the highest crime district, the highest murder district in Chicago. The king wanted me to set up his kingdom in the roughest place in Chicago. Now, I want you to turn to a script that's found in Ezekiel. And this is in Ezekiel chapter 30, 36. In Ezekiel chapter 36, I'll start reading here at verse 33, thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquity, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities 
and the waste shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, wherein it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and the desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and inhabited. And the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places, and I plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will what? I'll do it. So it's interesting here, he plants me in a desolate place. And I know sometimes ministers who finish ministry school, they tend to try to find a place on Pill Hill, you know, place where everybody's prospering uh, and so forth. But many times God knows what you need and he knows the potential that he has inside of you. And one of the things I preached this for almost eight months, I preached on something called the blessing. Say the blessing. When you even say it, imagine that B being capitalized. We're not talking about, hey, bless you, brother. Praise the Lord. Oh, bless you. Amen. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the blessing. We're talking about what was put on Adam that Adam could turn any place in the earth into the Garden of Eden. That same blessing is on you. Say it's on me. It is in me. So here I am going to this place. So I took it over. Nobody had a bank account. I remember that. Everybody's money was in their pocket. And so as I ministered there, I even, they even took up an offering for me. Why? Because we had sold everything. We'd sold our furniture. We'd sold uh, our uh, clothes. We'd sold everything. We're we going to live this thing. We're going to see what this king will provide. Now, I'm not tempting God. I'm just saying we were sold out. And so um, I remember we were uh, in the lady's house staying there for about six months, eight months. And then God said, okay, it's time for you to get out of here. And I remember we went to look for some places. Now, it's interesting. Every time we tried to save some money, something would happen. The car would break down or something would happen. And so... Uh, I said, listen, we're going to find this place by faith. So we went out and looked at some apartment buildings and tried to get an apartment. So as we did that, there was a nice luxury apartment. My son, David, was just, he was knee high to a bird dog at that time. I'm using Pastor Andrew's <laughs> expressions now. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he was in the backseat asleep and we passed by this nice luxury apartment building and he lit, he raised up out of the seat and said, we're going to sit, we're going to stay right there. I said, boy, shut up and lay back down on that seat. <laughs> Why? Because that was challenging my faith. See, Jesus is the author and challenger of your faith. He, he is the one many times that will bring you out of a situation and cause you to use your faith because faith is the order of this new government. It is the only way you can live successfully in it. And so what happened? We looked at some other place they just didn't do. We went back to this luxury apartment building and we went and we, just like we had all the money in the world and everything, and we sat in there and the lady said, sure, we'll show you some big, uh, we have three bedrooms, we have two bedrooms, we have one bedroom and we have efficiency, of course, and so forth. And she said, what would you like to see? I said, well, just show us all of them just to see, we could just see how they, you know, I'm talking like I, I got something, but I do, I have the kingdom, praise God, I got the king in me. <laughs> And so what did I do? We started looking at them and so forth. She came back and she said, okay, which one would you like? I said, well, i tell you what, you know, it's, let's see, maybe we'll start. And I started real low. She said, oh, oh, that's, that's all you want. Okay. Well, i tell you what, we can set up for you to move your furniture in on Tuesday. I look at my wife and said, furniture? She said, you don't have any furniture? I said, well, we're coming off the mission field. She said, oh, oh. Okay, well, we've got some model apartment furniture in the basement. We'll let you have that until you get yours. I said, praise the Lord. She said, okay, now it's going to cost uh, one month's rent plus we take two months security. I said to my wife, security? Then she said, you don't have security? I said, well, you know, we, we believe. She said, listen, she said, I tell you, I'll just take the rent 
and we'll spread your security out over the whole year. We'll just do that. I said, all right. She said, okay. Now it's going to take, and whatever she said, I look at my wife and repeated what she said. <laughs> my point to you is the king has set up this thing now. The king has got me covered. And so the next thing that happened in that, in that uh, little place that we were meeting, it was a storefront church. And so now we're in that praying one day and all of a sudden somebody breaks in the front door. When I say that, I mean, they just pushed it open in a panic and it was a lady. She said, who's the pastor? I said, I'm the pastor. She said, I got drug dealers on my block. They come out 12 noon. They leave at 12 midnight. Our kids can't go play because they're selling drugs. We are terrified as, as the neighbors. What are you going to do about it? Now, she's right. She came to the right place. The church is the most powerful institution in the world ever. See, people read Joel chapter two, I will pour out my spirit. That's fine reading, but start at verse one where you can see there has never been anything like you. And after you leave this earth, there'll never be anything like you again. And I'm saying the church is, she didn't go to the police department. She came to the church. And as she came there, I said, she demanded that we help her. I said, lady, get in this circle. She got in the circle. We took hands and we began to pray. Then we ended up praying in the Holy Ghost. That's why praying in the spirit is so, so valuable for you. So praying in the Holy Ghost, the Lord spoke to me, he said, take this oil, bless it, give it to that lady and tell her to pour it down the middle of her street. I said, lady, God is telling me to take this bottle of oil, to bless it, give it to you and you pour it down the middle of your street. Here's what she said. Well, give it here. <laughs> now, now let me say something. Can I say something to you? Many times steps of faith are not reasonable. I better say it over here. Many times <laughs> steps of faith are not reasonable. See, with God, just hear the king and do what he says. So what happened? I blessed it, gave it to her. She did exactly what I said. She went to her street, took that big bottle of oil and started pouring it. Came back in about five days. I'm in there, we were having a little meeting. She opened the door and with a big grin on her face. Pastor, guess what? Now interrupting me. Pastor, guess what? I said, what lady? She said, the drug dealers uh, came out the next day for one hour, left, and never came back. Here's what's happening with leadership. Because they have no vision, they have no revelation from God, they're trying to solve the problems in their own wit wisdom, in the wisdom of men instead of the wisdom of God. And what you've got is you've got a situation. I don't know whether you've ever heard of some of the mythological characters and so forth like that, but you've got one of these characters and, and he was um, a mythological character thrown to the earth, gone to the earth, kind of supposed to be part man and part God. But what he was supposed to do was fight something called a hydra. A hydra, I think is nine, is the number nine, nine headed animal, kind of like a dragon with nine heads. And he's supposed to fight him. And so now he takes his sport, sword out and he cuts off the head, but he's got a problem. As fast as he cuts off one head, two grow back. And I'm saying that as fast as they cut off Al Qaeda, ISIS grows back. And I'm telling you now that we need visionary leadership. We need people who can hear from God and do the will of God. Say amen to that. Amen. The lady didn't have to go to the precinct. She didn't have to form a block club. She didn't have to do any of the things that people have tried to do to try to cut off the crime and so forth that's going on. 
My point to you is God has an answer before the problem ever came. I'll do it again. God has an answer to your marriage before the problem in it ever occurred. God, can, can, I, can I preach here? I'm just saying this is your season. This is your year. The world is looking for somebody who's got vision. And that is you. Say, I'm the one. So Jesus, again, being the author and finisher of our faith, a lot of times people are trying to go somewhere safe, somewhere that's easy, somewhere that, that there's no, no challenge, so forth. That's not where Jesus leads you because he's responsible for developing your faith. That's found in Hebrews, I think, chapter 12 and verse two. He's gonna develop you. He's gonna take you right by the hand and say, follow me. Here's what he told them. Here they are now, they're with Jesus. He finished his preaching on seed time and so forth and in, in the kingdom. And then he said this, let's go to the other side. Mark chapter four, verse 35. And so here they start going to the other side. He took him even as he was, and there were also little ships following him. That's an apostolic alliance. There were also little ships following him. Then, all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, a storm came. A storm came. Now you'd think if Jesus is leading them, then he must be hearing from God. And if he's hearing from God, why would God lead him into a storm? And I'm telling you right now, some of the worst storms can take place when you're in the perfect will of God. You are in the perfect will of God. Here they are going over here. Listen, don't be moved by it. And so what happened is Jesus had fallen asleep. They woke him up and said, Master, don't you care that we are about to die? I'm putting it in my own words. Jesus rebuked the wind, said to the sea, peace be still. And the next word that came out of his mouth is why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So it, it, it you know, some people think that God uses Satan to make them stronger. Satan is self-employed. <laughs> God uses the word to make you stronger. And so here they said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea, watch this, obey him. Now, a lot of people say, well, he could do that because he was God. Folks, I'm sure uh, the brother Walmack has taught this, but he set his Godhead ability aside and became as a man. If he had operated as one of the Godhead, he would have been illegal. Been illegal, couldn't do it. He had to take on that anointing and became a man anointed by God. Watch this, just like you. Just like you. He is a sample son. I'm just looking at all that Jesus did under that anointing. He could preach under that anointing. He, 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 could, he could teach under that. He demonstrated the power through healing and deliverance under that anointing. Watch this, fed 5,000 under that anointing, plus women and children. I'm saying all this is taking place under that anointing. Say, I'm anointed. anointed. Same anointing is in you and on you. Yeah. Why? Because it flows from the head right down to the body. Amen. So I'm saying oil represents the anointing. And through that anointing, every drug dealer left that whole community was gone. Every drug deal. Now this is me starting out. And folks, I've been from one adventure to another. And at the same time, God has been increasing my faith. 
So at first, I'm just believing for an efficiency apartment. An efficiency apartment is where you wake up and see everything. You don't have to move your spot. You stay right there. But that's not so today. Because I've been living by faith. And when you do, some people think that once you live by faith, it means that you go and sit on the park bench all day and feed the pigeons. No. Faith is hard work. See, that's why he says he's called us to a rest. Faith is a rest. And I had to work or labor to enter into that rest. Where did I labor in? Word of God. Where did I labor in? Doing what he says. And each time I did, my faith grew. My faith grew. My faith grew. And at first, I'm just believing God for what I can, hopefully I can get. <laughs> you know. I've got right now, can I say some things without somebody getting jealous and crazy? <clears throat> Isaac, let me have my bag there. The, oh, did Isaac go to the other building? Oh, he's here. <clears throat> Isaac has been my assistant for a number of years. He just started his own church. Give him a hand clap, praise God. <clears throat> Venezuela. <clears throat> I was just looking here. And uh, I needed an airplane. So here I was in a, one of the pastors from Africa came to visit and I had him to speak that Wednesday night. And this is what he said in the middle of his message. Pastor Winston, your airplane is in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and went back to preaching. <laughs> Man, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. So what do you think I did? <laughs> Whoa, didn't you know? <laughs> I read it. I didn't see an airplane. <laughs> read the whole chapter again. Still didn't see an airplane. Without a vision, without the revelation of God. All of a sudden, I read it again in verse 20. I saw a piece in it, it said, a bird of the air shall carry your voice. <laughs> that was my airplane, watch this, in seed form. And in the kingdom, a seed is all you need. Amen. What did I do with it? I ate it. <laughs> I took it and began to confess it. I took it and began to meditate it. Now it's going from my head to my heart. Look at Mark's gospel, chapter four, please. And look at verse 14. Mark chapter four, verse 14 says this. The sower sows the word. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the way you do in the kingdom. And look at verse 26. He says this. He says, and he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. He shall sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He doesn't know how. Next verse. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. And, but when the fruit 
is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Inside of you is soil. What does God supply? Seed. Take the seed, put it in your mouth, and speak it into the soil. Now the seed should spring and grow up. He doesn't know how. First the blade. Mm. So here I am, I finished preaching one Sunday. A lady comes up to me with a big thing like a shopping bag, but I could tell something heavy was in there. I said, um, she said, Pastor, uh, God told me to give this to you. I said, what is it? She said, well, it's something God told me to give you. I backed up a step. I said, well, what, what, is, what is it? Praise God. She said, well, God told me to give it to you. I said, well, open it up. Let me look in there. Let me see what's in there. And it was an aircraft piston. I said, Lord, you're going to give me this thing in parts? No, no. Once it starts manifesting, something's going to change on the outside. I understand. I could have, a lot of things I could have done, but I said, I'm going to get this by faith. I'm going to do it according to the kingdom. And the next thing you know, we end up with an airplane. The one that I, now some others came across me, but that was those too small. I had to wait on what I felt God was having the right one. Now it's time to get it. I had to put in the sickle. So another man at another ministry said, hey, uh, uh, he's getting a new airplane and so forth. We wanted some people who are part of that uh, group. If you want to sow into this airplane, I turned to my wife and I said, baby, God is telling me to sow for this airplane. What are you hearing? She said, I'm hearing 100,000. 100, I said, I'm, that's what I'm hearing too. Praise God. We took, wrote that check, 100,000, sold it into that ministry. Our airplane came barreling in there. Now, I ask you, don't get jealous. Don't hate. Don't get envious. Because you might need a house. Or a husband. <laughs> I won't find you in a minute. Or a kidney. The same way. Everything God's going to do for you, he has already done. Say amen to that. Now tonight, if the Lord leads me, I'm going to teach you on restoring your soul. Because this is key, because it can't operate except through your soul. And if your soul is damaged, this doesn't operate. Glory to God. So what happened? Got it. But now, after a few years of flying it, it's just been a blessing to us. It's not a tool, not a toy, it's a tool. And going, and we put more miles on it. Now they said, hey, you got to add something to it and so forth. And it would cost, I don't know, anywhere from 600000 to a million dollars. And they said, if you don't add this to it, by December 31st of this particular year, last year, and then you, uh, or year before last, and this airplane no longer can legally fly until you add those things to it. Well, I put it off trying to get those things. I said, well, I believe for it. I put it off and put it off. And sometimes God wants you to be able to find the path yourself without you being forced into finding it. So what happened? Look at, I said, all right. All of a sudden, December 31st came, my airplane was grounded. I said, Lord, have mercy. I got to get an airplane quick. Well, what kind do you want? Well, I want to step up. So I go, can I, can I talk about all of this? Yes. See, I'm not talking about get rich quick. I'm talking about 
turning waste places into the Garden of Eden. I'm talking about the same faith you're going to use to stay healthy. I'm talking about the same faith you're going to use to speak life into your children. This is the same faith, folks. I'm just using something tangible as an example. So what did I do? I said, okay, I need this airplane. Now, what am I going to do about it? So I said, God said, now believe for it and use the same seed. A bird of the air shall carry your voice. I said, okay. Then he said to me, now watch this. He said, uh, now what is the interior going to look like? So I went online and it made it so you can design your own interior. I said, I don't know nothing about designing interior. I said, let me find a picture somewhere. I took that book and aviation book and opened it up and found a picture. I said, that's what I want. I don't know if the camera can get me a close-up camera. Can you, can you close in? Can you close in on that? Now, this is a picture. I said, I want it just like that. Folks, that airplane that I just landed at looked just like that. You know what I did? I used this as a faith prop. Now, wait a minute. I hurt my knee playing tennis. I went to the doctor. He says, you have broken your meniscus. Why don't you just get a new knee? I said, what do you mean new knee? He said, well, they have artificial knees. I said, no, I play tennis, man. I used to play tennis in college. I used to play tennis. He said, well, you can do that. I said, no, I, I, I know they got those out there. But God told me in the kingdom, he would supply all my needs. <laughs> so what do I do? Go in the scriptures. Now, it's okay. I'm just telling you another level of faith that you can go to. I found a design of a knee with a meniscus. <laughs> now understand, I couldn't hardly walk. I couldn't bend my knee. Now that, this is different now. It's, it's different now. Now, now I'm, I'm only saying something. What do you need? Some hair? What? No, no, listen, listen can, I, can we talk? What do you need? You're a kingdom citizen. Now, true enough, you can get an artificial this and that. It's according to your what? Faith. And that's all. I want to use my faith to the fullest extent. And it's all right, artificial this, and thank God for medicine. Thank God for doctors. I'm not at all, because doctors are anointed. There, 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 are, there are apostles of healing. Say amen to that. But if I can just show you what God did for me, hopefully that'll encourage you that he'll do the same thing for you. I'm not really, that, please hear me now. I am not bragging at all. This is not a bragging spirit here. But I got something else here. <laughs> the other thing that I've got, I'm just trying to find the paperwork. This is an agreement because I got a new airplane this is an agreement between me and a certain church that I'm going to give them my old one. Oh, man, you all see. No, 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 wait a minute. Somebody said, well, why don't you sell it? It's worth more as a seed than a sale. I'm trying to get the kingdom advanced. 
I'm not trying to give this airplane to somebody to haul whiskey around in. We got to save souls. Say amen to that. All right. Are you with me so far? Say visionary leadership. You know what happened to Abraham? <clears throat> the Bible says that God told Abraham, now take thy only son Isaac up on this hill and offer him up. What did Abraham do? If you look at the movie, Abraham and Sarah both are crying. Oh, Lord Jesus, Holy Son. That is not what had happened. You look at Hebrews 11. Abraham had already received Isaac raised in a figure. He'd already gotten a revelation of it. Let me show you another one. How about in Mark chapter 10? In Mark chapter 10, two people. One is a guy named a rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus. What shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not kill, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. He said, well, all this have I done from my youth. You know, religious people already, they always done everything. You can't tell. That's why I tell them, get on, get on out of here then. Just go on. Go on, do what you want to do. And anyway, I should, come on, I'm, I'm acting like I'm acting wrong now. Okay, so what happened? He said, then do this. Go your way, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come on, take up the cross and follow me. Watch this. He was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. You know what he thought? He thought he was going to lose something. But God will never receive anything from you without giving you more in return. So what happened? He went away and Jesus began to preach. And he got down to verse 29. Mark 10:29. And Jesus answered and said to him, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. And then he begins to name them uh, houses, sisters, brothers. And then in the next verse, he said in verse 30, and oh, in that verse he says, an eternal life and so forth. Now, I was trying to leave my company, IBM. We were in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and we had started our ministry. And it was growing. We had moved from one YMCA to a bigger YMCA. And now God spoke to me, he said, all right, I want you to go full time. In other words, leave your job. I was a regional marketing managing computers in IBM that identified me to go fairly high up in the company. So I had everything kind of laid out. So I set a time that I would leave. As the time began to get closer, I began to get weak. I said, well, Lord, <clears throat> let me set another time. You know what time that is? Let me say, do you know what time it is? It's time to quit. But I got eight minutes. <laughs> See, I had to get it from the king. All right, now. <laughs> so, so what happened? <clears throat> I did that. I, I moved my date. The date came again, watch this. I moved it again. Yeah. I said, I need some help. Well, I had information, but I needed revelation. So, 
I heard Jerry Savelle preach a message on seed time and harvest. Inside of that message, he went to Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, and something went off inside of me. He said, take that, meditate it. I began to meditate that scripture. I was coming down St. Paul, I was coming down University Avenue in St. Paul, Minnesota one day, just out of the blue. Something exploded inside of me, boom! I said, wow, I saw myself. I saw me leaving, not leaving the job, but sowing the job. And I saw this huge something out in front of me. Whoa. I went and told my boss, I said, John, I'm leaving the company. He jumped up, closed the door. I said, sit down, Bill, what, what's, uh, bring him some coffee. Uh, what, what's wrong? I said, John, I, I got a call on my life. He sat back in his chair, never forget it. You got a what? I said, I, I got a call on my life. Bill, take two weeks off. <laughs> he knew I was, come on, out of my mind because he knew what I had set up for me. He knew it. But see, without a vision, see, people trying to do God's work without God's vision. And I'm telling you folks, when you get that vision in you, the hardest job becomes easy. You get sweatless victories. Things happen to you. People come to you. They, uh, all kinds of things. All the struggle comes out of it because you got revelation. And I'm saying from this meeting, God's going to take you to a level that I'm prophesying now that you didn't, you didn't even expect going to come in your life. But you're going to be seeing things that you've never seen before and seeing them in a way that you've never seen them before. So what happened? That date came. You know, he, I took two weeks off, came back. He said, Bill, how you feel now? I said, John, not only am I leaving, I'm out. <laughs> and here I am. Let's just cover a couple of things here. Because I want to, wow. Um, hmm. <laughs> Let's go. I'm, I'm going to stay on this same vein. I see I've got all kinds of things for you here teaching. I want to teach you some on organization that you don't plan by, by uh, you, 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 you don't you know, your planning and how he's supposed to do it. But let's, let's go something. Let's go to Ma Matthew chapter six again, if you will. Wow. Am I making sense to you at all? Now this is fundamental, but it's key because what I want to do is I want to ensure you that no matter how old, how young you are, no matter how many mistakes you make, you've made, you know, I'm preaching a lot of times to people who've been incarcerated for a few years and so forth and so on. Right away, they write themselves off, see? They, they say, no, I, ca I can't have this. And I know you've got Ma Matthew chapter six. Turn very quickly to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter, glory to God, chapter six for me, please, and verse 20. Just look at that. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Glory to God. He says, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Some people think that because people are poor, they're not to give. That is the worst thing you can do for a poor person. I'm talking about one that hears the gospel now. Because 
Once you do sow a seed, it's God's way of meeting our needs. And one of the biggest problems that we have in the kingdom is provision. There is nothing capricious about the nature of God. He will not give you an assignment and not give you the provision to do it. And I had to learn that. And so now what happened was I, I needed, well, let me just give you a very short story. I got what, four minutes? And give you a very short story. Here I was in the ministry, we had started and the church was really growing. I mean, it was getting sizable. And one of my members came to me and said, my boss would like to see you. I said, who's your boss? He said, my boss is, uh, is uh, he calls his name, and he's a chairman of uh, Fortune 5, that was headquartered, 500 company, that's headquartered in Chicago. I said, okay. He said, uh, he'd like to see you right away. I said, yeah, okay, well, make an appointment, I'll go see him. So I went to see him, I said, Bob, uh, my name is Bill Winston, so forth. So I said, Reverend, come on in, sit down, and so forth. He said, let me tell you the story. He said, I was down at a Chicago club, and I was talking with the chairman of Newsweek magazine, and he was asking me, what are you doing for black male youth in Chicago? I said, told him, what, what do you mean? He said, are you doing anything for him? He said, well, why would you ask me that? He said, you're here, you got all these resources, what, what are you doing? He said, well, nothing really. And so he said, I got home, and I spoke spoke to my daughter, who is a lawyer, and I spoke to her and I mentioned that to her and she said, well, what are you doing? Reverend, that thing began to bother me. I want you to tell me what can I do for the black male youth here in Chicago? I said, okay. I said, I can't tell you what you can do right now, but give me seven days and I'll have your answer. Now, how did I know that same way Daniel said? Give me overnight and I can come up with the answer for you, Pharaoh King. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So what I'm saying here is same thing. God's got the answer before the problem. And you and I have access to the answers. So we can pull the answer down. This is a, a problem should be the best thing that can happen to a believer. <laughs> because we've got a way to get promoted. And so what happened was, I said, all right, I went home prayed about it, believe I've received it, thank God for it every day, all of a sudden one day, roof, here it comes. I put it on about five or six of those uh, uh, pieces of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper as a, as a PowerPoint, and then I went back to him. I said, uh, Reverend, come on in. So, uh, he had given me his cell phone and everything because he, he wasn't sleeping well. And so I showed him, and, and I got to the third one, and, uh, and I went through that. He said, that's it, Reverend. That's it. He said, I've got $40,000 right now in the, in the office here in the chairman's fund. Can you take that? I said, no, no, no. I have not set up a bank account yet. I'm, I'm watching the devil. See the devil. I've not set up a bank account yet. Wait till I set that up. We'll get it. He said, I've got all you need here. Let's get that job done. I said, praise God. What did I do? Implemented. Went out. Talked to the superintendent of schools of Chicago. They wouldn't talk to me, but the lieutenant talked to me. I got, they said, can you come to a principal's meeting? They after tomorrow and introduce your program. Went to the principal's meeting, went through the program. The principals got excited after the meeting. They barraged me. I said, wait a minute, I can only take 20 students because that's what the plan called for. Then I got 20 students, brought them there. I said, I, God said, me, bring them there on Saturdays, give them a breakfast, and then after you finish teaching them, give them lunch. He said, make sure you go through one half hour of the Bible and call it covenant talk. See, all of this God has for you. He's got a strategy for you to take your ministry to a whole nother level in no time at all. Come on now, come on. See, in the kingdom, you don't grow by, by Lord have mercy. You don't grow by time. Glory to God. You, 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 I, I've watched things. You, you, it, when, you do, when you do it by faith, it overrides a lot of the time that you would need. Lord, help me, Holy Ghost. So what happened then is I took it and we implemented the program. I brought the kids in 
We picked them up by bus and so forth. One of the big uh, catering companies heard we're going to feed kids. They said, call me and said, Reverend, we'll give you free lunch and free breakfast every Saturday that you meet. Now, why? Because faith is contagious. If you got it working in your life, you'll see it draws every good thing that God has for you. So next thing that happened, I started meeting with him. I said, all right, what do you want to be? This is the first day we met. They either wanted to be Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, or Big Mike, or somebody. And, and I said, wait a minute. So what happened? Then six months into the program, I said, what do you want to be? What did we do? We exposed them to different role models and so forth. And then they, I said, don't tell anybody, draw it on a piece of paper. So what did they do? They drew it, but one of these guys drew the paper and he had all these pieces of paper stuck together and pasted together and this big structure. And I said, okay, guess what this is that he has? They couldn't guess. I said, okay, tell them what it is that you have on your paper that you wanna be. He said, this is one of my hotels. And I'm telling you right now, there's a way to get people out of the place that they are. There's a type of, of provision that God has for you that's already been laid out for you, but without a vision, come on, help me now, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So I'm saying to you right now that I have come this far by faith. And I'm here to tell you how I did it because a lot of times preachers preach about it, but they don't tell you how to do it. I want to give you step by step how not only you can start in faith, but you can stay in faith and you can finish in faith. God, God has big plans for you and they are so big till he won't even introduce them all to you at this level. You gotta grow some for you to even, big God for you to show you these things. But I'm saying at this conference, we are gonna, glory to God, we are going to reignite your faith. We are going to rekindle the vision that God had for you when you were just a little child and you were able to believe and imagine anything. It's your time again. You have become a little child of God and God is going to stir up that imagination. Don't say I'm too old. Don't say I'm not edu ed educated enough. Don't say anything about this. What you need to do is rejoice because God is about to do something for you that you you never thought could be done. And anything holding you back, I'm going to preach on it tonight, it's going to fall off of your life. This is going to be a year of such prosperity of God's people. Let me tell you that things are going to be coming to you and you're going to be helping folks that you never thought you could help. And these people are going to see who your God really is and say, I want Jesus. Give me that God that you have. Say amen to that. Your days of being broke are over. God is about to not only fix your finances, but fix your marriage, fix your body, fix your business. He's fixing everything. Why? Because we are going into the days of heaven upon the earth. I came with $200 and what God will do for BW, he will do for you. All you need to do is say, Lord, use me. Don't let him go any further. Don't let him just stop by. What did that song say? Please don't pass me by. Well, you don't need to sing that, but God is not going to pass you by. He's got some good things for you. I came to announce to you that whatever's been holding you back is about to let you go. Whatever's been stolen from you, it's coming back to you. God's people are not going to leave this earth owing back rent and back mortgages. They, uh, uh, it's going to be houses full of good things that you didn't fill.
We're going to take these cities back and we're not going to apologize for it. You're going to be bold as a lion. And the Bible says that lion turns away from any. You're going to be so bold to people say, what has happened to him? Well, he went to that Andrew Walmack meeting and you know, she ain't been the same since. Miracles, miracles, miracles. That's what I'm hearing right now. Well, listen, I gave you just a little bit of my story. And I did that today to let you know that I started with $200. No place to stay. Nobody knew me. Watch this. And nobody cared. But today... He said, I'll make your name great. He said, I'll bless you. <laughs> those, I'll, I'll, I'll curse those that curse you and bless those that bless you. And in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. Were you blessed today? Um, I really want to, tonight, I want to talk about something a little bit different. But I guarantee you, it's going to encourage you like you've probably never seen before. Um, God, once he taught it to me, it took all the fear out of my life of what's going to happen to me. And um, it put a whole new level of operation in my life that I, I could not have even explain but it's gonna do the same for you. And I wanna teach on it. The subject is called vengeance and recompense. And it's, it's a subject that's not taught much in the church because I think the church hasn't had much revelation of it. But I wanna teach a little bit of it tonight and I guarantee you, whatever's been uh, harassing you will harass you no longer after that teaching. I know Brother Andrew has a, has a powerful Bible school, and I'm not sure whether some of the students are here or not, but I really want to encourage you, and I wanted to tell the story of how I came into the ministry and how I kind of got where I am. Understand everything I got came by faith. Our home came debt-free by faith. Our ministry's debt-free. Everything that... God passed on to me. I've got it, and I got it by faith. Even my wife. And uh, after th over 33 years, and now kids in the ministry, all of that happened by faith. Because there was, there was a challenge. The devil tried to kill two of my daughters, my, my two daughters, each individually. But I got him off by faith. And I'm just saying... I'm just saying, faith is the way you make it happen. Now, faith doesn't work without love. Doesn't work without love. All this hate stuff is not from God. It's not from God, folks. That thing that just happened in Chicago, a group of us pastors were trying to find the parents of the boy to just call her to apologize. Say, so, ma'am, we're not all like that. We love you. We hate that that happened to him. But we're going to pray and that God will restore him and so forth. So there are some things happen, happening. But if you've got a lot of faith and no love, it doesn't work very well. God wants us to love our neighbor. And folks, if you do that and you get wealthy for the right reasons. You're going to see this thing is going to make you just, you'll have joy going in and coming out. I want to thank you again for giving me the time with you today. Did you get something out of what I said today? I, uh, 
I just want to add to what uh, your leader is, is, is teaching because he's a good Bible teacher. And uh, I just want to add to it. I know you've heard some of these things before. That's why I didn't try to go into a whole lot of revelation. I just want to tell you my story and just let you know that the way I got here is I left everything. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but I had to do it because I wanted to see who God really is. And let me tell you, he has never let me down. I have been in some places that are tight, tight, tight. And I'm telling you, God, every time I prayed, God answered that prayer. So this is going to start, this meeting, this year, is going to be a new level in your life. There's going to be things that you've been waiting on, they're going to be released to you this year.